Thanks, Christos. Uh, so we've known a long time in economics and game theory that uh, equilibria, things like Nash equilibria, you know, been not necessarily optimal. Tons of famous examples, prisoner's dilemma, tragedy of the commons. This morning, Christos mentioned Brace's paradox. Uh, but something that wasn't obvious at all until the past 15 years or so was that there's actually lots of applications, lots of classes of games that we're really interested in where you can prove that equilibria, while not fully optimal, are approximately optimal, provably. Okay? They're provably near optimal. So these are so-called price of anarchy bounds. And a number of researchers, many in this room, have, have given a lot of different such bounds in different applications over the past 15 years, a lot of greatest hits. Uh, something really cool has happened over the past five to seven years, though. And what used to be sort of a motley collection of bounds for different application domains has really coalesced into, I think, a, a very cohesive and, and general theory. And so now, as an analyst, if you're tasked with proving uh, guarantees for equilibria in some games that you care about, there's now a quite powerful toolbox which isolates exactly what are the details about your application you have to understand, and then once you understand those details, there are these powerful theorems that allow you to immediately extend that to uh, very, really, very strong general bounds. So the subject of these two talks are going to be uh, this toolbox, which again, I think, you know, it's powerful, but it's also very user-friendly. So I hope uh, this sort of empowers you to use these for, for more theorems of your own. So just to make this a little more concrete, let me open with a representative result. Okay? And it's OK if you don't remember what all of the words mean on this slide. I'll fill in all the details as we go. This is to give you a sense of where we're going to be going, where things are leading. And this is a guarantee which simultaneously I think is extremely strong. But secondly, in these two talks, I'll give you all of the tools necessary to prove this theorem, and of course, many others. So what's this result? What's this price of anarchy bound? So it's about if you're selling multiple items that are not identical items, okay? So you have to sell a bunch of things to, the, to various bidders. And so how are you gonna do this? Well, if you, if you actually really had to solve this problem, like if tomorrow you literally had to sell a bunch of things, uh, you might start simple. Right? You might see if you can get away with the simplest imaginable case where you say, look, we've got a lot of good single item auction formats, second price, first price auctions. If we have M items, why don't we just run M single item auctions in parallel? Okay? Or put all of the goods up on eBay, if you like. Okay? So how well would this work? Would this work well? Would this not work well? So this theorem identifies conditions under which this extremely simple format actually gets welfare surprisingly close to the maximum possible. Okay, surprisingly close here means 63%. Here equilibria means Bayes-Nash equilibria. When I say Bayes-Nash equilibria, you should say what's the prior distribution. Actually, it doesn't matter what the prior distribution is as long as the valuations are independent under a substitutes condition. So this is in the spirit of what Professor Arrow was telling about this morning. So for this theorem, we assume that valuations are submodular, meaning that a bidder values other items less. The marginal value for items are less as it gets more items. Okay, so sort of diminishing returns. So in a substitutes type situation, this very simple auction format is provably close for every prior product distribution, for every Bayes-Nash equilibrium with respect to that distribution, almost as good as the maximum welfare. And I want you to appreciate this statement on at least three different levels, okay? So first of all, I just think the question is, is really nice, and it's something you actually might really want to know the answer to, right? So maybe, you know, like the situation I already gave, you're a seller, you have a bunch of items, and you're like, well, do I have to come up with some custom mechanism from scratch to solve this problem, or can I just, you know, really just rely on something simple like put everything on eBay? So this theorem gives you guidance about when it's okay, you need a custom solution and when you don't. Or think about someone tasked with designing a combinatorial auction, you know, for selling spectrum licenses or what have you. Again, you want to know, you know, can we just pretend like it's the early 90s and just run a separate simultaneous, just run simultaneous ascending auctions, one per item? Or do we need to incorporate some kind of more complicated package bidding, where people, where bidders can uh, submit a bid on a subset of goods, not just individual goods? Again, this theorem you can interpret as trying to help give guidance about it by saying, in a substitutes type situation, separate single item auctions is really not as bad as you would expect. Adding complexity to the auction format can only gain a relatively small amount. The second sense in which I want you to appreciate uh, this theorem is this number, okay, this 63%. All right? So, you know, without context, it's not totally clear whether you should regard this as a high or a low number, but at least for people who are used to proving approximation, uh, there's something interesting about this bound, which is even if you thought about the seemingly much simpler situation where there's no players, there's no private valuations, okay, I just want you to come up with an algorithm, computationally efficient algorithm, 
which computes an allocation which is close to the maximum possible welfare. Okay, so just approximate the maximum welfare with an efficient algorithm. The state of the art for that problem is essentially 63%, and it's not easy to design algorithms which meet the 63% guarantee. So despite the fact that on the design side one has done almost nothing, one nevertheless can prove that the equilibria are achieving performance comparable to state of the art efficient algorithms. So 63% for approximating this optimization problem is pretty impressive. The third sense in which I want you to appreciate this is just like forget about it being true. Okay, so it's impressive that this is true, but third that we can actually prove it. Okay? So why should you be impressed? Well, this is a statement about every single Bayes Nash equilibrium for every single common prior. Okay? We have no idea what Bayes Nash equilibria look like in these games. No clue. In fact, if there was one item and there were two bidders, and the bidders have different valuation distributions, even then, we don't really understand what the Bayes-Nash equilibrium look like, okay? even in a single item first price auction. So we surely don't know much about what Bayes-Nash equilibrium look like at this level of generality. Characterization would be hopeless. Nonetheless, we can still prove these worst case bounds about all equilibria. Okay? And again, in these talks, I'll give you all of the tools needed to prove results of this form. All right, so we're going to do the first two parts today, and I'm going to open with some work which now is fairly old. It's over five years old. But even if you've seen this before, I think it's important to go through it because this is going to be an important analogy to have in your mind when we pass to the more uh, complicated uh, parts in parts two and three. So even though most of these lectures are going to be about auctions, which are most naturally modeled as incomplete information games, I want to spend the first part about full information games. I'll also remind you what the price of anarchy is, introduce you to smooth games, and the paradigm of extension theorems. Okay, so to jog your memory about the price of anarchy, again, this is always already mentioned this morning by Christos, but let me just return to an old setting near and dear to my heart, which is routing games. This is the same topology Christos had, although the numbers are different. So the price of anarchy, what is it? It's really just uh, an approximation guarantee for equilibrium. So you compare two things. You have a game, you have an objective function, and you will say, well, you know, how, what's the objective function of an equilibrium? And then what's the best imaginable objective function if I hypothetically had full control over the system? So it's a comparison between two objects. So in this game, there's only one equilibrium. It's easy to see. Okay, both players have dominant strategies. Oh, I should tell you what the payoffs are. So there's two, there's two players. Each has three strategies, the, the three pass from S to T. The edge labels, what that means is that means the cost incurred by a player as a function of the number of players X using the edge. Okay, X is going to be one or two because there's only two players. So th this is never worse than four, so this beats five. The five X is always better than 12. So the dominant strategy is for a player to take the zigzag path. So the unique equilibrium has both players on the zigzag path. Each of them incurs a cost of 14 for a joint cost of 28. The assumption is that this is what we'd ideally like to minimize. So the second question is, could we do better if we had full control over the system? And we could. If we split the players on different paths, then they'd stop interfering with each other. Yeah, the green player would still have 14, but at least the red player would have dropped to 10. So the joint cost is 24. Okay, so the ratio between these two quantities, and this by definition is the price of anarchy, is 7 over 6, 28 over 24. So in some sense, selfish behavior is costing us 16% you know, in terms of the average delay of players in this particular example. As you know, there can be many equilibria, and there's various ways you can handle that, but what I'm going to focus on in these lectures is the traditional worst case guarantee, where if you have many equilibria, you want a bound that applies to every single one. This absolves you from worrying about what equilibrium might be reached by the players. Okay? So that's the definition of the price of anarchy. Now, I'm sure, I mean, a number of people in this room have proven these bounds before. But for the benefit of those of you who haven't, let's just pause and say, you know, if I gave it to you as a homework assignment, you know, prove the best upper bound you can on the price of anarchy and routing networks like this, how, you know, what would that proof look like? How would you go about it? And the good news is uh, that you can really mostly just follow your nose, and then when the occasion calls for it, do a little algebra. Okay, so let me show you what I mean by that. So let me introduce some notation. Okay, so this is really for any game with a finite number of players, each of whom has a, later it'll be a utility function, for now it's a cost function. So this is a strategy profile, like a traffic pattern in a network. This is the cost that player I incurs in this particular strategy profile. And again, the assumption is we want to minimize the joint cost. So we're supposed to prove a bound on the price of anarchy. So fundamentally, we need to relate the cost, the objective function value, of an optimal solution S star versus uh, arbitrary Nash equilibrium S, okay? 
So pick your favorite arbitrary Nash equilibrium. We start with the equilibrium cost. Really what we want is a chain of inequalities, only getting bigger and bigger and bigger, terminating in the cost of S star times some constant. Okay? That's what a proof like this is going to look like. Equilibrium cost at most some constant factor times the optimal cost. So we start with the equilibrium cost, which by definition is the joint cost. And now, you know, certainly one main thing we have going for us is our assumption that S is a Nash equilibrium. Okay? So if S was some arbitrarily crazy outcome, we wouldn't be able to prove anything. But it's a Nash equilibrium, so we should use that hypothesis. And so how should we do that? Well, we could say, well, what does it mean to be a Nash equilibrium? It means if any player did anything different, it would only get worse. Okay? So if we hypothetically think of player I switching to some other strategy, we're going to get an inequality of the right direction. Okay? The corresponding i term will only go up, holding other player strategies fixed. So hypothetical deviations gives us upper bounds on individual player costs. That's good. We want upper bounds. So that leaves the question, OK, so what hypothetical deviation should we use? This is sort of a, a sort of degree of freedom for us as an analyst. You know, here there's only two things on the board. There's the equilibrium and there's the optimal solution. So as what I'll call a baseline strategy, we can think about, well, what if player i switched to what we wish it was doing? It's strategy s star i and the optimal solution. Okay. So the ith term here is the outcome in which i has unilaterally switched to its strategy in the optimal solution. Okay. It was a Nash equilibrium, so that ith term only goes up. We can do this for all n of the players. All n of the terms only go up. Okay. So I will sometimes refer to this S star as baseline strategies. Okay? It's truly really saying, you know, if a player you know, switched to one of these baseline strategies, because we had an equilibrium, we could only go up. So this is what I meant by following our nose. Now, right, without saying anything about the game, it's not clear how we'd make any progress. Okay? But let's say now, actually, there's a class of games we care about. Routing games with linear cost functions. Right? We know it can be as bad as 7 sixths. Can it be higher? If so, how much higher could it be? So what might the rest of the proof look like? Okay? So we're stuck right here. So the thing to realize, so just at a very meta level, this is some number that we don't care about at all, per se. This is some weird entangled version of these two outcomes, S and S star. For a price of anarchy bound, the only two quantities we care about are the equilibrium cost and the optimal cost. So in some sense, the rest of the proof implicitly or explicitly, what it's going to be doing is establishing a relationship, an upper bound, on this entangled quantity in terms of the two quantities we care about, the equilibrium and optimal costs. So that's going to look something like this. Okay, this is what the rest of the proof is going to look like. You could imagine, right? so here's where we stopped last time. This is what we don't care about. These are the two quantities we care about. You could imagine more complicated functions of those two costs, but we'll be able to get, able, get away with linear combinations. Okay? So we're going to think about the rest of the proof looking like upper bounding this entangled term by a linear combination with coefficients lambda and mu of the optimal and equilibrium costs. Okay? So lambda and mu here are parameters. Mu, as we'll see, should be less than 1. Lambda, we're hoping, is a small constant. Okay? Five-thirds and one-thirds would be good parameters to, to keep in mind if you like. So suppose we could prove this, okay? and who knows if we can, and for what va parameter values. But suppose we could prove this, then we'd be done. Okay? We take the last slide, so using the Nash equilibrium hypothesis, the equilibrium cost is upper bounded by this entangled term. By assumption, by star, this is upper bounded by a linear combination of the optimal and equilibrium costs. Since mu is less than 1, we can subtract from both sides, divide through by 1 minus mu. And we conclude that, indeed, the cost of this arbitrary equilibrium S is no more than lambda over 1 minus mu times the optimal cost. Okay? Since the equilibrium was arbitrary, this is the same as a price of anarchy bound of lambda over 1 minus mu. Okay? The smaller the lambda, the smaller the mu, the better this bound, the closer this bound is to 1. Okay? So all I've done now is I've reduced what these bounds might look like to proving a statement like this for the best constants lambda and mu that you can. And that's where you have to do a little algebra, and that algebra is going to depend on the details of your game. And so many people have done these computations for different games. It's a very rich theory now. Let me just continue with the routing game example and show you sort of a canonical uh, variant of this. And this is not something I want you to understand in detail at all. This is due to Chris Studelou and Kutsupius. And what it proves is that the price of anarchy in those routing games can be 2. It can't be any higher than 2.5. Okay? And that bound is tight. It's known to be tight. So, so let's start at the bottom. Okay? So ultimately, so th oh, I meant to write this on the board. This is a good expression to have available. Use 
these are the baselines. Okay. So this was the kind of, kind of inequality we wanted. Okay, so I've just restated that in the bottom of the slide here. Here's the entangled quantity, optimal equilibrium costs, lambda I've set to 5 thirds and mu to 1 third because those turn out to be the optimal parameter values. So how would you prove a statement like this for routing games with linear cost functions? Well, observation one is that, you know, in these routing games, everything just adds over the edges, okay? The objective function value, players' costs, and so on. So this really reduces to proving the analogous inequality on a single edge at once. And if you can prove it for every single edge, then you have it for the full-blown traffic patterns. Even on an edge, now you can use the assumption that the cost function's affine, and you can say, oh, well, the worst case actually is when you just have the identity function x. And so you just need the analogous version of this inequality for a single link with the identity function. That inequality looks like this. Okay, so it's a relationship between a product of a pair of integers and those integers squared. And now you do some algebra, you figure out what the best choice of lambda mu is, and you discover after a little bit of elbow grease, it's 5 thirds and 1 third. Remember that the bound that you get is lambda over 1 minus mu. So with lambda 5 thirds and mu 1 third, this was going to be 2.5 as promised. Okay? So the upshot being, again, we did some just follow your nose stuff, which would work for any game whatsoever, and then we did a bunch of algebra specific to routing games, which gave us the magic number of 2.5. Now, I want you to notice something, again, I did, the point is not to go through this in detail, but even from the high level description I gave you, there should be an important property which is evident, which is, in all of this algebra, never did we use the fact that this was an equilibrium, S. So if you remember in our motivating statement, we wanted to take an arbitrary equilibrium S, say it was close to an optimal solution S star. So we're only worrying about the case where S was an equilibrium. In this sub-piece for this lemma, we did a bunch of algebra, just using additivity of the congestion games, using the affineness of the cost functions, and then some kind of relationship between pairs of integers. None of this has anything to do with S being an equilibrium. This inequality actually is proven by the exact same algebra, no matter what the outcome S is, okay? Any traffic pattern in one of these networks. Doesn't matter if it's an equilibrium or not. And also doesn't matter if it's an optimal solution or not, but that's, that's not relevant, okay? So the algebra, at least in this particular case of routing games, is, uh, you know, it does, it does prove the inequality that we wanted, but in an even stronger form than what was required. Okay, so we're gonna give this stronger form a name. We're gonna say a game is lambda mu smooth, with respect to particular baselines S star, if the same inequality we had holds, but not just for one equilibrium S, but for every single outcome S, okay? And again, the algebra on the last slide proves exactly this property with lambda 5 thirds and mu 1 third for routing games with affine cost functions, okay? So game is land and you smooth with respect to baselines S star, and just think of S star as the optimal solution. If you can disentangle S from S star, charging against a suitable linear combination of the individual costs, no matter what S is. Okay, so you choose S star first, this should be true simultaneously for every S. That's what it means for a game to be smooth. Okay. So if the game is lambda mu smooth, then certainly the price of anarchy is at most lambda over one minus mu. This is an even stronger condition than what we needed before. Before we only needed star to hold for equilibria S, smoothness is a definition simultaneously for all outcomes, including non-equilibrium outcomes. Okay, so what, right? Definitions are really cheap, right? Anyone can get up on a board and write down any definition they want. What makes the definition interesting? Two things, examples, Implications, all right? I've given you one example, affine routing, uh, affine routing games, which are smooth with nice parameters. There are many, many, many others, dozens of others. There's now so many, uh, it's actually futile to try to list all the smoothness arguments on a single slot, and I'm not gonna do it, okay? So there's dozens and dozens of examples of interesting games which meet this condition with small values of the parameters. So those are the examples. What about the implications? Why should you care if a game satisfies this condition. I mean, it gives you a bound on the price of anarchy of Nash equilibria, but we didn't need the stronger condition for that, right? So what use is having the stronger condition? So to answer that question, let me mention sort of a different research agenda that this dovetails with, which there was a lot of nice work on about 10 years ago. And so a number of people observed a potential conceptual issue with price of anarchy bounds, right? So what does a price of anarchy bound mean? It means if a game is at an equilibrium, 
then the outcome of the game is close to optimal. That's what it means. And why are we not satisfied with this kind of statement? Well, we're a little concerned about the strength of the hypothesis. If the game is at an equilibrium, then blah, 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 blah. Why might a game not be at an equilibrium? Well, depends on what kind of equilibrium you're talking about. But pure equilibria, which is actually what I was talking about so far, they don't even exist in lots of games, as you know. They do always exist in those routing games, but in general, they don't always exist. So then you're not talking about anything. Okay, if it's an equilibrium that doesn't exist. Mixed Nash equilibria, so they exist in, in finite games, but they are hard to compute in various senses. Okay, PPAD complete, even for two-player bi matrix games, even harder once you have more players. Okay? So the concern is that, you know, the, in the games we're looking at, the equilibria are good, but the players will be playing out of equilibrium, and therefore the performance of the system or the performance in the game will not be near optimal. Okay? That was sort of on a lot of people's minds mid last decade. And there is a long stream of work approaching this from many different directions. Okay? I'm only going to focus on one of the directions in terms of no regret sequences, but there's lots of nice work in terms of best response sequences and other things as well. Okay? So for today, the story is going to be the following. All right, so we're concerned that players fail to play Nash equilibrium and our price of energy bounds don't apply. Well, if players aren't playing Nash equilibrium, then what are they playing? Okay? We'd like to weaken the assumption to make it behaviorally more plausible. Now, we need some kind of behavioral assumption, right? I mean, if you have a routing game and some player just plays on some link that has cost a billion, you're not going to prove anything interesting. Right? So you need some control over what players are doing. Now, this is a problem, you know, so this idea of what other equilibrium concepts, this is a problem where there's a rich literature whose shoulders we can stand on. Okay? So in particular, uh, there's a lot of work in both game theory and computer science stating you know, roughly that it's actually not that hard for players to learn to play more permissive equilibrium concepts, like correlated equilibria or coarse correlated equilibria. Okay, so for the people with a more kind of computer science background, this corresponds to algorithms that minimize internal regret. This corresponds to algorithms that minimize external regret, like say multiplicative weights. Okay? But the takeaway from this slide is that while Nash equilibria appear to be difficult to compute even by centralized algorithms, there's lightweight learning algorithms for players such that the empirical distribution of their joint play converges to these bigger equilibrium sets, correlated equilibria, coarse correlated equilibria. Okay. So I will, so I'm not going to define, I will define no regret sequences in a couple slides, otherwise I'm not going to define these formally, but I'm satisfied if you are just aware of the following picture. Okay? Which is in any game, you can look at a hierarchy of equilibria, okay? where you make weaker and weaker behavioral assumptions, and therefore more and more things get deemed in equilibrium. Okay? And therefore it's more plausible that play is somewhere in that set. So the smallest set is just the pure Nash equilibria. Okay? So everybody puts a deterministic strategy, no one can do better. These need not exist, so that's a problem. Mixed and Nash equilibria, those are only more general. They exist, but they can be hard to compute. Even already, once you get to correlated equilibria, What's cool is these are computationally tractable. Okay, you can write them down as a linear program, or as I mentioned, there's learning algorithms where the uh, empirical distribution of joint play converges, and then coarse correlated equilibria corresponding to no regret sequences, this is even bigger. So this is in some sense even easier to compute, even easier to learn. So, and so in other words, when you, if you prove price of anarchy bounds about these outer two sets, we sort of dodge the intractability critique. Okay, these are outcomes where if we can prove a bound for every single outcome in these big sets, all of a sudden it starts looking quite meaningful. Okay, for example, it implies that if players are using certain learning algorithms, then the price of anarchy guarantee holds. All right? The problem, of course, price of anarchy, it's a worst case measure. Okay, it's governed by the worst of all of your equilibria. So the more things are equilibria, the worse your price of anarchy. Okay, it can only increase with the size of the equilibrium set. Okay? So it's going to only get bigger as you go up this Venn diagram. So therefore, the coolest thing that could be true, right, what you're really hoping for, is that actually the price of anarchy all the way out here is exactly the same as it is down here. Okay? It's not going to be any better. If it's different, it's only worse. So you're hoping that the price of anarchy for the biggest set is the same as for the smallest set. Now, that's not going to be true in general, okay? but it's going to be true under conditions which are met in many cases. The other thing, it's not going to be true sort of on a game-by-game -game basis, but when you're talking about the worst-case price of anarchy over classes of games, which is what we often do in computer science, then all of a sudden you start being, having this coolest possible result, that the price of anarchy is exactly the same for the most permissive set as for the most stringent set. But they're realized in different games. 
Yeah. The worst cases? Yeah. No, so the way it tends to work, I don't have a general theorem about this, but for all the cases I've thought through carefully, there's a single worst case game which is bad for all of the equilibrium concepts simultaneously. Basically because they wind up just being, you know, sort of uh, the worst equilibrium is a pure equilibrium and therefore it's all of the other three as well. So what more happens is if you do have these games where the best pure equilibrium is better than the best, sorry, the worst uh, pure Nash is better than the worst mixed Nash, which is better than the worst correlated, etc. But, you know, those are games where the pure equilibria are somehow much better than the worst case bound for pure equilibria. Okay, so for a specific game, for like if I just gave you one network, these 10 nodes, these 17 edges, you really would get numbers like, you know, 1.1, 1.4, 1.8, 2.2 .2 in general. But when I think about, you know, what's the worst case price of anarchy bound for every routing game with affine cost functions, all of these are going to be 2.5. Okay, so... Let me prove to you the following results. So this is the connection, right? So I, I told you about the smoothness condition, and I didn't tell you why you should care. Why is it interesting if a game satisfies the smoothness condition? I just said, you know, this is satisfied by many existing price of anarchy proofs. So here's the reason why you should care. So if you have a game which is lambda mu smooth, then not only is the price of anarchy of pure equilibria at most lambda over 1 minus mu, but actually every no regret sequence, which I'll define for you on the next slide, but it's really a, a sort of much wider set of stuff than Nash equilibria, also obeys exactly the same approximation guarantee. Okay, so remember lambda over 1 minus mu, this is what we were proving before for pure equilibria. This theorem is basically saying, whether we knew it or not, we were proving exactly the same approximation guarantee for the fattest of those four equilibrium sets. Okay? So this is, the, this is kind of the first meta theorem, which says, base, well, I'll say more about that later. Let me actually do the, do the proof and then talk more about interpretations. All right, so what is a no-regret sequence? Okay? So we fix a game, it's like a fixed network, and we think about the game being played over and over again on T consecutive days. Okay, so like rush, rush hour traffic on a bunch of mornings in a row. So it's no regret if the following is true. Every player I, okay, so every player is adaptively perhaps trying to pick a, a good strategy on each day, you know, like a different road to work every day. It had some average cost, okay, over the T days. And so the no regret says, well, in hindsight, after seeing the cost after seeing what other players did every single day, you're allowed to best respond okay, with a single action playing every single day. Okay? So in other words, suppose you gave a player of an option of going back in time and instead of doing what it actually did, instead picking its favorite action QI and playing QI day after day after day. Okay? So no regret just means that players were sufficiently smart as they played this game over time to do at least as well as the best fixed strategy. Okay, the best fixed strategy. So as I mentioned on the, a couple slides ago, there's some very lightweight learning algorithms that give you this guarantee. Multiplicative weights is one you hear about a lot these days. There is a regret term which goes to zero as t goes to infinity. I'm just going to ignore this. This, is, this sort of harmlessly gets carried through the analysis on the next slide. Okay. And then one special case of a no-regret sequence is you just pick your favorite Nash equilibrium and you play that again and again and again and again and again. That's a no regret sequence, but the whole point of this is no regret sequences can get much, much weirder than just a pure Nash equilibrium over and over again. Okay? So it's really only an equilibrium condition on average over time. In no way can we conclude that any of these out outcomes are equilibria in any sense. Okay? So this is a theorem where once you have the definitions, the proof just writes itself. But now you really just follow your nose and you don't even ever have to do any algebra. Okay. So we have a smooth game, lambda mu smooth game. We have a no regret sequence S1 through ST. Let's prove a bound of lambda over 1 minus mu. So let me just multiply through by capital T just to save notation. So we're summing over the days. We just look at the, total, the joint cost on day T, which we expand over the players just like we did at the beginning of the talk. Now, this is actually the step which seems like trouble compared to our Nash equilibrium analysis at the beginning. Because what was the next step we did when we were following our nose last time? We said, oh, well, S is in equilibrium. So if it switches to S star I, that gives us an upper bound on the individual player cost, which is good. But, you know, a given S sub T, remember, this is not an equilibrium. We do not know that these things are equilibria. We only have a time average equilibrium condition over the whole sequence. So if I walk up to player I at day T, and I forced it to switch to this S star strategy, its cost might well go down. 
Okay? It might be better off. Because again, there's no assumption that ST is in equilibrium. So let's defer the issue with some notation. So just define delta IT as the amount that player I gets better if on day T I force it to switch to S star I. Okay? So in a Nash equilibrium, this would be non-positive. Here it could be positive. Okay? So it's how much better it got by switching on day I, uh, on day T to S star I. And now hopefully you can see where this is going. We're going to use the smoothness condition to disentangle all these entangled terms. We're going to use the no regret condition to control all of the deltas. Okay? So the smoothness condition, that's this over here, except remember, smoothness by definition requires disentangling no matter what the outcome S is, whether or not it's in equilibrium. And that's exactly what we need here because we have no idea what this what this, strategy, what this strategy profile ST is. It could be anything. Our only control is, again, time average over the sequence. So it's really good that our assumption allows us to disentangle, in particular, this entangled term. Okay? So that gives us uh, lambda times the optimal cost plus mu times day T's cost. Let's look at these regret terms. So the way I want you to think about this is first fix a player I and then think about summing over T. What was delta IT? Delta I, that's how much better I get if I force it to switch to S star I on day T. So what's the sum over T of delta IT? That's how much player I gets better overall if every single day I force it to switch to the time invariant strategy S star I. Okay? So the no regret condition exactly says that for every player I, that inner sum is non-positive. Individual terms could be positive, but the sum of all the days is non-positive. Okay, so I can just drop that without harm. All right? And then dividing through and rearranging gives us the desired lambda over 1 minus mu bound. Okay. So here's a cartoon, which is how I kind of like thinking about this and how I want you to think about things later in the talk as well. I think of this as an extension theorem in the following sense. So this is a tool for the lazy analyst. Present company definitely not excluded. Um, so, you know, we want to prove a theorem. And in the conclusion of our theorem, we want to have the most meaningful guarantee possible, right? Which means we really want to sort of be able to say that every equilibrium from the biggest set possible is near optimal, like coarse correlated equilibria, no regret sequences. So this is what we want to claim in our theorem. Now, when we're tasked with actually proving the theorem, it would be much nicer if we didn't have to think about all these crazy distributions, okay? For mixed Nash equilibria, let alone like correlated, coarse correlated, and so on. So boy, would it be simpler if we could just think about pure Nash equilibria. And indeed, this is actually, this analysis is the fun part. This is where you learn what's special about your game when you just think about pure Nash equilibria. And so the goal of an extension theorem is to just take a bound. It's meant to be a black box translation that takes as input a price of energy bound on pure Nash equilibria and spits out as output the exact same price of energy bound, no degradation, for this more permissive equilibrium set. That's what it does. Now, again, you can't have this totally generally because there are games where some equilibria are better than others. But what have we learned? We've learned that if you prove a guarantee on pure Nash equilibria using a smoothness proof, okay, by establishing the stronger lambda mu smoothness condition, then that type of price of energy proof for pure equilibria does extend losslessly out to no regret sequences. Okay? So it's a special type of bound on pure Nash equilibria can be extended by the argument on the last slide to extend automatically to no regret sequences. Automatically? Yes, automatically. By the argument you gave before. Yes, exactly. So basically, I mean, in some ways, think of it this way. So the hypothesis here is land and use smoothness. The way I think of that is you proved the price of energy bound on pure equilibria following a certain template. But is that, Tim, is that the way you'd actually most efficiently prove it? I mean, I'm trying to think about this as I look at your paper. It's not, unless the game is really well chosen, it's not obvious to me what the lambda mu smoothness is. So it's not clear if I was starting to no vote to get a price of energy bound looking at pure and ash. But I not, is, is this establishing the stronger smoothness condition typically as easy as, as proving the more restrictive result? I mean, Good a, question. So uh, the question is basically, right, so you know, if, if you just wanted to prove a price of energy bound, you could do it, you could prove whatever you want, right? And now I'm tying your hands. I'm making you do it a certain way. I, I have a reason for it. It's because I want these, these sort of more general statements. But, you know, how much are you losing? 
So, um, with, so that something very strong can be stated for routing games um, and a couple other games, which is that actually you can prove that you lose nothing from smoothness. So in other words, if you take the minimum provable bound via any smoothness argument, you always get exactly the right answer. Okay, so you can prove that totally generically for congestion games. That is not true for every single class of games one might care about. And it's an open question to understand better which games have, I call this tightness, which games have this tightness property and which classes of games do not. But, um, yeah, so if you look at routing games on parallel links, those are not, you cannot prove the tight bound of four thirds using a smoothness argument. But, but you said, but I thought you said that routing, uh, routing, games, uh, routing games with arbitrary network topologies. Oh. Right, so whenever I talk about routing games with cost functions, yes, yeah, so, so, right, so, so, so when you're talking about routing games, I guess there's two, well, there's a few parameters, but I usually focus on the cost functions, but you can also say, what are the networks I'm allowed to use? And so the tightness happens when you're allowed to use any network you want, okay? But if I say, oh, no, you're only allowed to use parallel link networks, as many links as you want. But you have another theorem that says that parallel links tell you everything about... Uh, so that's for the non-atomic model. Yeah, so for the non-atomic model, actually, parallel links capture the full complexity. But with atomic games, you get these separations depending on the topological complexity. So, yeah. So there is some understanding of how much you lose with smoothness. I would say empirically, you know, if you just look at the literature, pretty much... So there are some games, so, th so to give you a non-example, so there are some games where basically you, pure equilibria are good and smoothness won't let you prove it at all. And the biggest disaster, like a good example of a total disaster would be like a network formation game where, you know, people form links, unilateral, bilateral, I don't care. And often in these models, if it's disconnected, people have like minus infinity payoffs or really bad payoffs. And if you try to check these smoothness conditions, they're, they're just totally a disaster. But pure equilibria are often very good in many of these network models. On the other hand, right, so even mixed Nash equilibria are total disasters when you have those, that kind of payoff setup. And so the statement I would say empirically looking at the literature is like pretty much for all the games, you know, I'm sure there's some exceptions somewhere, but I can't think of one off the top of my head. Like, whenever you can actually prove good mixed Nash equilibrium bounds, there seems to be a smoothness proof behind it. But that's not a formal statement. Routing games, it's a formal statement. That's just an empirical statement. As far as, you know, if you, so, as far as, like, how do you come up with these yourself, uh, I mean, I, I guess, again, sort of empirically, how do you normally, you start trying to know, like, what's the guess going to be? So you try some small games, you're going to come up with some bad examples. Then you start sort of trying to prove some upper bounds, maybe for special cases. And it just seems like, you know, you know like a black, you know, like kind of some gravitational force, you just get pulled into these smoothness arguments. It's just sort of, sort of how it seems to work. Okay. Wait, so are you going to interpret the smoothness condition at all? I'm not going to interpret the smoothness condition at all. I mean, I can only give you a, a very vague... How about motivating the word smoothness while you're at it? Sure. So... <laughs> I mean, I think, so it's a little, I mean, so a valid complaint would be, you know, we, I'm just looking, I'm thinking about, you know, games with basically arbitrary finite strategy spaces. So there's really like no non-trivial topology. So like, what could I mean by smooth and this kind of thing, right? But, you know, still, you know, when I look at this, it's sort of playing the role of kind of a Lipschitz-like condition, in my opinion. So basically, you have some starting point, some starting strategy profile, S, and then you think about doing sort of a one-dimensional deviation. And then you have a collection of these one-dimensional deviations. So it's almost like, you know, you're in a cube and you take kind of like, you know, a star of deviations. And you're basically saying, you know, you can control how much the joint cost varies uh, as you look over all of these deviations. And somehow, you know, what does it mean to control it? The thing which is, so this is somehow like, you know, proportional to, you know, so this is like your starting point, And this is kind of how far you went. And this is parameterized by the directions that you're going in. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know of any extremely crisp characterization of, of it, and I'm not convinced that there is one, frankly. Um, crisp, I'm sorry, I missed the question. Crisp, I'm not convinced that there's any crisp reinterpretation of the, this exact smoothness condition. So the, the one thing, the one thing, one thing which is interesting, which is going on, is there's some new work using fresh duality uh, to bound the price of anarchy. So I think, I think Nikhil Devener is maybe doing part of this. Um, 
who's here. And that, you know, at least there's sort of, you get sort of duality type interpretations. Um, and, but it's sort of an open question. It seems sort of related to the smoothness stuff, but it's an open question to actually connect them. So, so it's not clear to me that one would ever come up with this concept unless you were focused on proving price of anarchy bounds. But if you believe that we care about this, then I think you should care about the definition. So following up on, on Drew's point, I, I, I look at that condition and I want to interpret it as saying, my actions do not have a big effect on your costs. Yeah, not player by player, but in some player average sense, yeah. So if I interpret it that way, then it seems like the theorem says, if I'm in a game where my actions do not have a big effect in the aggregate on other people's costs, then is it so surprising that under the most permissive solution concept, I have the same bound as I do under the more restrictive solution? You know, I think the fact that there's positive correlation between, you know, what you said uh, and price of energy bounds is maybe not that surprising. The fact that you'd have such tight numerical exactness coming out of this, I don't see any way to, you know, see why that would be a priori obvious. So, you know, I agree, like if the right answer is 2.5 and this gave you like a 10, you're like, oh, we're ballpark, and then it'd be kind of like, well, maybe that's trivial. But to actually nail it and then nail it in a way you can even prove that it nails it in very generic senses, I, I think there's something reasonably fundamental about it. So, uh, to double check, you don't, you don't need an again to be smooth uh, with respect to every strategy profile. You only need an again to be smooth with respect to a certain put and off strategy profile, right? Excellent point. So the way I've stated this is I said you should be smooth. So, so remember, with respect to something, that's referring to the S star. So this is stated where S star is an optimal solution. If there's many, you can pick whichever one you want. The same proof says, oh, if you want to pick S star to be a two approximation, then you're just going to lose that two in this bound. You'll get a two lambda over one minus mu. And conceivably, that flexibility could be useful to, to choose use suboptimal outcomes. Uh, is there some game without this smooth property but still has a good Privacy or anarchy or privacy or total anarchy. I'm sorry? Is this a necessary <coughs> condition? I mean, is there some example, uh, some can without this property but still has a good privacy or anarchy? Yes, there is. So in many cases, they go together, but these network formation games are an example where this doesn't work at all, but it still has a good price of anarchy for pure equilibria. But I would, you know, if you look in the literature, I would say 70% or so. This gives you exactly what you want. So it's by no means everything, okay? but it's really a, a quite wide swath. Okay, so let me, uh, in my remaining time, say a little segue a bit into games of incomplete information. So this is all games of full information. So a lot of these talks are going to be about auctions. Auctions, we think about incomplete information. And again, so this will be a little quick if you've never seen games of incomplete information before, but I think it'll still give you the gist. Right, so first of all, like, what, what's the difference, right? So, well, you know, like imagine Ava and I are playing rock, paper, scissors, right? So this is a game of full information. Why? If she plays rock and I play scissors, she knows my payoff. My payoff's minus one because her rock breaks my scissors, right? So this is game of complete information. She observes the outcome, she knows my payoff. If Ava and I are playing in a first price auction and Ava observes me win, at a price of $7, she does not know my payoff, okay? Because my payoff depends not only on the fact that I won this auction and paid $7, it depends on my valuation, what I would have been willing to pay. Okay, if my valuation was 10, my utility would be three. If my valuation was four, my utility would be minus three, okay? So auctions, right, you don't generally know exactly what other people are willing to pay. So it's a game of incomplete information. So how does this change? Okay, so let me just describe it in terms of the deltas of what we've seen. So there's still players, there's still actions. Uh, and so by the way, now, now think about auctions from now on, okay, until further notice. So you can do all this stuff generally for games, general games of incomplete information, but let's just think about auctions. So actions here will be bids. Types, think of these as just valuations. Okay, so a type is known only to player I, all right? Like a valuation for a good. So now, the assumption when we do so-called Bayes-Nash equilibrium analysis, as a player, you don't actually know the other player's action. I don't know how, say, in a first price auction, the other player is going to bid, because I don't know its valuation. Now a strategy is a mapping from values to bids. Okay? So as a player, I might use the strategy, you know, if my value is 10, then I will bid 7. If my value is 12, then I will bid 9. Okay? So strategies are functions from the private types to actions. How do players reason about the other players? 
Well, again, we want to have player I not know what others' valuations are, but we'll make the common prior assumption. So all valuations are drawn from some commonly known distribution. Okay, so everybody knows the distribution. You only know your own type realization. You do not know the realization of the other players. Okay? And then what does it mean to do a best response? It just means you do the best thing for yourself given what you know. What do you know at the time that you take an action? You know your own valuation. So, so again, think like bidding in a first price auction. You know your own valuation. You know the distribution from which others' valuations were drawn. And you know their strategies, their mappings from valuations to actions. So by virtue of having a distribution over, over their valuations and knowing their strategies, you have a distribution over their actions, like over their bids. Ergo, you can best respond. You can say, given that this is the distribution of bids, what's my expected uh, utility maximizing bid? For example, so these can get tricky. So let me just r remind you of a couple examples. Suppose you have a first price auction, N bidders. Let's say they're all IID from 0, 1. Okay? So I'll just state it and let you check it as an exercise that the Bayes-Nash equilibrium is for every, so it's a first price auction, so you're going to bid less than your value. And the exact amount that you should bid less than your value is n minus 1 over n. So if there's two bidders, you should bid half your value. If there's three bidders, you should bid two-thirds of your value, and so on. So the more competitive the auction, the less you will shade your bid. Okay? So that's the Bayes-Nash equilibrium. For, and notice this is the, of the form that I said. This is a mapping. Given the valuation, it tells you what the bid is. Okay? So this is a nice equilibrium if you care about price of anarchy bounds because you'll notice that because this mapping is the same for every player, the player who bids the highest will also be the player with the highest valuation. So the winner of this auction is going to be the player with the highest valuation. If you care about welfare maximization, that's exactly what you want. Okay? So this is actually a full welfare based Nash equilibrium. Okay? When bidders are IID from a uniform distribution. This same conclusion holds much more generally for IID bidders, not just uniform bidders. But as soon as bidders are not identical, keep them independent but not identical, things start getting a little weird. So you have two bidders, valuations drawn uniformly from 0, 1 and 0, 2. Okay. Then no Bayes-Nash equilibrium has full welfare. Okay. Equivalently, Sometimes the lower value bidder will be the, sorry, the lower value player will submit the higher bid and win the item. Okay, that's what it means to not be full welfare. Sometimes the wrong player wins. Why does that happen? Well, so morally, what did we learn from this exercise? Right? From a bidder, the more competitive it is, the higher you should bid. Okay? So if you have one strong bidder and one weak bidder, from the strong bidder's perspective, it's like they have weak competition. So they're going to shade their bid a lot. From the weak bidder's perspective, it's like they have strong competition, so they're going to shade their bid not very much. Okay? So because they have different shading strategies, you get inversions in the bids, and you can have welfare loss. Right? So again, one thing to realize here is just that... You are going to shade more even in the low territory? Yeah. I mean, relative to what you did if you were facing a different ID bidder to yourself, say. Oh, I see, of course. Yeah. I mean, in particular, I mean, some of this is trivial, like you say, right? So, like, you're never going to bid more than one, for example, right? But, I mean, it's more than that. You're really going to just shade much more aggressively if you're the strong bidder. Yeah. But, so, I mean, so what I want to point out to you is that, you know, there's, there's actually, like, a really, really fundamental question here, like, just staring us in the face, right? So, from a price anarchy perspective, symmetric first price auction is not interesting. I mean, for good reason. You know, for a nice reason. They just work really well, if you believe in equilibrium analysis. Non-identical bidders, you do not have full efficiency. And it was, as far as I know, basically never studied in economics, you know, trying to quantify what kind of efficiency loss was possible or not possible in these kinds of first price auctions. And it's right in the wheelhouse of the price of anarchy questions. Okay? And in fact, it remains an open question now exactly what is the price of anarchy in first price auctions with independent bidder valuations. Okay? There's some nice bounds about it, which I'll talk about. But I just want to point out, even just for first price auctions, there's completely novel open questions you can ask because of this perspective. OK. So notice, right? so when we talk about Bayes-Nash equilibria, when you talk about the Bayes-Nash equilibria, it's with respect to a prior distribution. Okay? If you change the prior distribution, it changes players the way how they think, changes their expectations, changes their best responses, changes the equilibria, changes the game. Okay? So you cannot speak about doing Bayes-Nash equilibrium analysis without saying what the prior is. 
So now, oh boy, okay, so how should we set the prior, right? Any particular choice of, I mean, you know, you could have it be uniform, something, but kind of any prior would feel pretty arbitrary, right? So if we can get away with it, what we'd really love to do is prove a price of energy bound about Bayes' Nash equilibria that applies no matter what the prior distribution is, okay? For every single prior distribution, we'd like some fixed universal constant approximation. So let's, it's not clear if we can get that or not, but let's just think it through a little bit. So what would it mean to prove a price of anarchy on, on Bayes-Nash equilibria for all possible prior distributions? Well, here's one type of prior distribution, a point mass. You deterministically know everybody's valuations. Okay, that's a special case. So that's, the, that's sort of the induced full information, right? So this would be like a first price auction with known valuations. So, if you prove a positive result for every possible prior distribution, you're certainly proving that positive result as a special case for every possible induced full information game. Okay? You have no choice. That's a special case of what you're trying to prove. In the contrapositive, a bottleneck to any Bayes-Nash equilibrium bound is negative results for the full information case. So remember, when we had the hierarchy of equilibria and we passed to the much more permissive coarse coiled equilibria, we said the coolest thing that could be true was that it was no worse than pure equilibria, because it couldn't be better. Same thing here. What's the coolest statement that could be true about Bayes-Nash equilibria with respect to an arbitrary prior? The best case scenario is that it's no worse than the price of anarchy of Nash equilibria in the induced full information games when you fix the full type vector. It can only be worse than that Best case scenario is that it's exactly the same, okay? For worst case prior distribution bounds. Now, phrased that way, it really suggests this extension theorem paradigm, right? Which is meant to take bounds from a special case and lift them losslessly to the general case. So what would our idealized extension theorem look like for Bayes-Nash equilibria? Well, here's what we want, right? So like we said, at least for now, let's explore the idea that we have a Bayes-Nash price of energy bound for every possible prior distribution. Okay, that's what we want. So this is going to be the output of the extension theorem. What's the input? Well, we're going to input like the weakest possible necessary condition, okay? Which is, the, so say we're shooting for a price of energy of alpha. At the very least, the price of energy better be alpha or better for every induced full information gain. Okay, that's a necessary condition for this conclusion. Now, again, probably we're going to have to have some restriction on how that price of energy bound is proved. So that's why I added here, let's suppose we can use a smoothness type argument meaning inequalities of this type, to establish in every induced full information game that the price of energy of pure equilibria is alpha or better. Okay? So I think this is sort of the, the, the biggest hope for, uh, for an extension theorem. All right? And again, as a lazy analyst, this is exactly what you want. Because this is stuff we know how to do, and this is the stuff we want to conclude. All right. So here's the cartoon. I think you get the cartoon. All right. So we want... We want to conclude things about mixed Bayes Nash equilibrium, incomplete information games. Mixing makes proofs harder. Incomplete information certainly makes proofs harder. So maybe we can prove it just in the full information pure Nash equilibrium case and have an extension theorem to do the dirty work for us. All right. So let me tell you um, about how this is going to work. Right? So this is going to be a recap of the full, what we did in the full information case in the first part of the talk. And again, I'm just going to describe the deltas necessary to get this to work in games of incomplete information. And there's a number of ways to adapt smoothness to games of incomplete information. And I'm just going to tell you about one, you know, fairly, one optimized for the applications I'm going to focus on in these talks. Okay? But know that there are other paradigms as well. So here's what we did in the full information case. So we fixed a game. So back then we were thinking about routing games. We chose baselines, which should be an optimal outcome. And like in a routing game, there's usually no flexibility here. Usually there's just sort of one optimal, you know, routing outcome. Then you prove that for all outcomes S, you have this smoothness inequality. Okay, this is the same thing that's up on the whiteboard. And then we proved an extension theorem, which actually says the lambda over 1 minus mu bound holds for no regret sequences. Okay, so that's what we did. So what do we need to change for, say, a first price auction? So really just keep first price auctions in your mind. Let's start with step one. So in step one, we, we, we wanted to have the optimal outcomes be fixed. So remember, when there are private types, even to know what the optimal outcome is, that's only well-defined once you've fixed people's valuations. Right? You can't talk about welfare without knowing what people's valuations are. 
So here we're going to fix a setting like a first price single item auction and we're going to fix the private valuations of the bidders. Okay? So this is like looking at an induced complete information setup. This now fixes the optimal outcomes. Okay? For a single item auction, it's just outcomes where the highest bidder wins. So again, I've changed the terminology from S to B because I want you to think about auctions. So B represents bids. So the baseline bids, again, they should be some optimal outcome. Another thing which is now different is that whereas in a routing game there's usually only one optimal outcome, and it's something like a first price auction, actually there's zillions of them, right? Or at least zillions of optimal bid profiles. The optimal outcome is just the one where the highest bidder wins. There's an infinite number of bid profiles where the highest valuation bidder is the same one with the highest bid. Excuse me, opt welfare is highest valuation bidder wins. Okay? So as long as the max value bidder is the same as the max bidding bidder, we have optimality. So there's a large number of options at B star, and we'll exploit that. Again, we're going to just now want to prove it a smoothness inequality for all possible other outcomes. Again, I've changed the notation to B. Now, this thing's going to change in a couple ways. Some of it's cosmetic, and I don't want you to worry about it. Routing games, you, you think about minimizing cost. Auctions, you think about maximizing payoffs and welfare. So this is going to flip, and this will become a minus just because we switched from a min objective to a max objective. Okay, so that's obviously conceptually not important. The other thing is that I'm going to just set mu equal to 1 for simplicity, okay? because that will cover the applications I want to talk about today. So I'm following a version of the smoothness. Say it again. Mu equals 1 doesn't work, does it? Uh, so when you switch to a max for min, max. yeah, so there's a couple of things going on, which I'm, I'm shoving over the rug. Exactly, exactly. So I'm following a proposal of Sir Connus and Tardos here to have a version, an incomplete information version of smoothness, which is really kind of optimized to get the right bounds uh, for auctions, okay, rather than more general games of incomplete information. Yeah. So, uh, the here, I mean, you switch from the cost domain to the utility domain, where you used to think you could add constants to people's utilities and not change things, but, but these ratios, like the to change when you add the cost. So what's the right notion of, I mean, is it still just to me the, the ratio is before, or are you going to subtract something off to correct for anything? I'm basically going to assume that value, the valuations are in units of dollars. And I'm just going to be interested in approximating the dollar amount. So it's not clear how to really interpret these relative approximation ratios without, you know, fixing some units for which relative approximation makes sense. Right. Okay. Yeah. And as you're, the ratio you will get if we had one guy with value 1 and one guy with value 10, it would be different than if one guy with 2 and 12. We could just add a dollar in with value. That's right. Numerically, it was a different answer, but OK. Yeah, so I mean, this is like, so in Ricky's talk, he talked about some of the differences between additive versus multiplicative approximation. Both have, you know, both are, one is more meaningful than the other depending on the setting. Here, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, just because of the setup here, you're not going to have additive approximations because everything's scale invariant. Right? So somehow you think about welfare, you think about the equilibria. You know, if I just change the units of dollars, if I go from dollars to pennies, nothing changes and the price of anarchy doesn't change, which is exactly what you want. But as soon as you're sort of robust, as soon as you're scale invariance in this sense. I'm not referring to dollars to pennies. I'm referring to how if I added one dollar to everyone's value. Um, it looks to me like kind of the same situation that had this change to the value of the baseline case. Or, but I mean, it's, it's debatable, right? I mean, like, if you wanted to measure, like, income inequality, you know, and you added a large number to everybody, you know, their additive difference, you know, would still remain the same, but maybe there'd be a feeling that it was more equitable than when we started because the ratios would be different. Possibly. But, but Drew is suggesting adding one to their utility everywhere. So their utility for getting the object is one more. The utility for not getting up is also one more. Sure. And so that's different from the thing that Nikhil's asking about. I guess if you like, there's also a normalization assumption that at zero, yeah, so if you should, OK, that's, that's a good point. Uh, so thanks for the clarification, Jason. So yeah, on the other hand, if you shift upward, all these results just get better. If you shift downward, Pushing all the way down to zero below the sky. Exactly, exactly. But uh, I should have said that. So that's, that's the right answer to your question. Good. OK, so let me just, uh, I know I'm running out of time, so let me um, just uh, get through this last piece. So this is now the analog of the smoothness condition. OK? So the C's changed to U's. That's just because 
uh, we're, we're talking about auctions. And there's still the lambda. Lambda still gets multiplied times the optimal thing, which in this case is the opt welfare. And uh, you know, talking about revenue, this sort of now only makes sense because we're talking about auctions. And there's a notion of payments and so on. Okay? And again, you can have a version with a mu if you want, but I'm going to suppress it. Okay? So this is the new smoothness condition. And then now, before we were extending the no regret sequences to land over 1 minus mu, now we're going to extend the Bayes Nash equilibria. And mu is 1, and it turns out when the dust settles, the right answer is going to be lambda. Okay? So you want, you don't, you want to think about lambda here as something uh, at most 1. The closer to 1, the better. Okay? So this is the plan. Okay, this is how it changes when we go to the incomplete information setting. All right, so let me think about a good stopping point. So let me, let me do the following. So let me explain. Uh, so I'm going to skip the proofs, but I want to give you an example. Right, so why was this interesting in the full information case? Okay? It was interesting because, and what do I owe you? Okay, so I owe you an interesting example where you can establish this. And so I'll state the, I'll state the result for a first price auction, that this actually is met with lambda equal to a half, okay? giving us a price of anarchy bound of one half. The second thing I owe you, and the proof will have to wait till tomorrow, is I have to actually prove the extension theorem to you. Right? So for the full information case, we actually had this slide where we went through why it holds for no regret sequences. I need to do the same thing for Bayes-Nash equilibria, and I'll do that tomorrow. Okay, but let me just sort of finish the applications of this. Okay, so again, I'm going to go through the proof tomorrow. I just want to do the statement. Consider a first price auction. Okay. Fix the valuations. What we need to show is that for a suitable choice of baseline strategies, which should lead to an optimal outcome, so B star, for a suitable choice of baselines, for every bid vector B, the smoothness condition holds with some lambda. And this is the whole proof. Again, I'll go through it tomorrow, but it's short, you can see. You can prove via this argument that first price auctions satisfy the smoothness condition with lambda equal a half. Okay? In fact, if you use a smarter choice of B star, you can even improve the one half to 63%. This is the same 63% I mentioned in the representative result. Okay? So again, take away here, remember, you have a definition. Why is it interesting? You need examples, you need implications. Here's an example of the definition, first price auctions. Again, there are many others. If there's time, I'll tell you about some of the others. Okay? So you can establish this inequality in settings of interest. The second thing I'll give you is implications. So what? Okay? And the implication is that by, again, a proof that fits on a slide, in fact, whatever the prior distribution, okay, doesn't matter if it's independent or correlated valuations, whatever the prior distribution, under that hypothesis, which we just established for first price auctions with lambda equal to half, under this hypothesis, the price of anarchy of Bayes-Nash equilibria is the same lambda. Okay, so in other words, this is an extension theorem which says if you prove a smoothness inequality of this form, it easily implies a bound of lambda on pure equilibrium of every full information game. But in fact, by this argument, it more generally applies, it implies a bound of lambda on the Bayes-Nash equilibria for every possible prior distribution. Okay. So chaining those two facts together, we've learned the following. For every single possibly correlated valuation distribution, for every single Bayes-Nash equilibrium of a first price auction, the, equal, the expected welfare at that equilibrium is at least half, or even at least 63% with the optimization of the maximum possible, as if you were always selling to the highest value bidder. Okay? And again, we knew from the outset, even with two bidders and uniform 0, 1, and 0, 2, that we couldn't get 100%. Okay? We knew fundamentally analysis of the first price auction with non-identical bidders is a price of anarchy question. Okay? And this gives us bounds on one side, 63%. Turns out if you want to handle valuation distributions which can be correlated, 63% is tight. Okay, so there's an example. You can exhibit a distribution in a Bayes-Nash equilibrium which is off by that amount. As I mentioned, if valuations are independent, we don't know. Okay? Maybe someone in the room has a better example and they'll tell me. That would be great. But the best upper bound I could find for the independent case was 87% by Hartline, Hoy, and Taggart. Okay, so it's an open question to nail the case of first price auctions. Um, with independent valuations. Now, just to tie this back to the representative result at the very beginning of this talk, this looks very similar okay, to what I told you on slide two. The difference is this is a single item auction, and that was about selling multiple goods. 
Okay, but the guarantee is the same. 63%, it's an arbitrary valuation distribution. So the, it remains to understand how does the single item case extend to the case of multiple items. So that's what I'll spend the first half of tomorrow on. And then time permitting, I'll conclude with a technique for proving lower bounds in the price of anarchy rooted in computational and communication complexity. So thanks. Um, are there any examples where there's even like a tiny gap between what can be proved with smoothness and what's known for like correlated equilibrium? Yes. So, uh, in fact, that was a slide that I skipped. Uh, so, back in the full information case. Okay. So in the full information case, you can do a version, of, you can weaken the smoothness condition. And so it makes it easier to satisfy. So you can prove better bounds, but the concern is that the extension theorem is less strong. Okay, so you're trading off the quality of approximation with the reach of the extension theorem. And so what's the relaxation? Well, so in the basic version of smoothness, remember the order of quantifiers. You first fix your baseline strategies S star once and for all. And then an adversary, if you like, picks an arbitrary S and you need to verify an inequality. So in this variation, you actually allow limited dependence between the baseline strategy and the adversary's choice S in the form that the ith baseline strategy S star I is allowed to vary with SI. It cannot depend on S minus I. Okay? So you have a version of smoothness. Again, this is only easier to satisfy. And you know, for something like if you look at those routing games where players choose not just one path but can split flow over many paths, it actually turns out you can prove better bounds using this variation of smoothness than the original one. And in fact, you can even prove more fundamentally the worst case price of anarchy of correlated equilibria is strictly smaller than the worst case price of anarchy of coarse correlated equilibria. Yeah. You can ask the same question for coarse correlated equilibria and, <coughs> and coarse correlated equilibria and smoothness. Is there any examples that have a gap? Oh, OK. Um, so in fact, uh, that's a good question. The gap, if there's a gap, it can only be very small in the following sense. So I have a paper with Uri Nadav, which answers the question, to what, what is the largest equilibrium concept for which smoothness bounds apply? And it's a very mild generalization of coarse correlated equilibria. If you look at the proof that I showed you, which I think is on the previous slide, almost. Uh, if you look at this proof, one weakening you can do is that you don't actually really need every single player's regret to be non-positive. You just need it an average over all players. Okay, so if you want, that's kind of a new equilibrium concept where you only have the equilibrium condition satisfied on average over players. Clearly this holds. And you can use a duality argument to argue that game by game, it's not just in the worst case, but game by game, the best smoothness bound provable actually matches the worst of these player averaged uh, coarse quote equilibria. So to answer your question, it reduces to this case, you know, can you have a game where, you know, the best thing which satisfies this player by player is, you know, strictly better than one that satisfies it on average. I suspect you could come up with a contrived one that does it, but I've never done it. So you mentioned in the beginning that uh, even just algorithmically you got the same bounds in the first, first example, right? Yep. What about, so that's a compl computational complexity argument. What about communication complexity? So these learning algorithms also give you a way of communicating information, maybe about complicated evaluation uh, functions. Uh, and so maybe they even suggest kind of iterative auction mechanisms. Is that something? Yes, I've wondered about that. Uh, so the question is, is sort of, right, OK. So Vince, Vince pr proposes an interesting connection, which is, you know, so you, one approach to comfortable auctions like VCG and making them more practical is rather than doing direct revelation and asking people for all their values of all bundles up front, you sort of interact with them over time. And then there's some understanding of, you know, when does this work, have good incentives, when does this not work, and so on. And he's pointing out this sort of a parallel with, you know, if you run learning algorithms in one of these games with one of these simple mechanisms, it feels like it's doing... It feels like it's sort of a protocol of the form, same form, which is iteratively interacting with the players to learn something about the valuations. Now, in comparable auctions, usually you do something like a value query or a demand query. So you sort of like more directly accessing their information. Here, you'd have to more kind of do like a revealed preference to kind of guess what their values were given what actions they played. 
at least if you took this on face value. Be interesting. I've never, I've never seen anything about it. But you're, you're definitely right that sort of the, the learning, the positive results for the learning algorithms do translate to communication, non-trivial often, communication upper bounds on approximating, say, epsilon correlated equilibria. So that's always been an interesting implication of learning algorithms. Tim? Yeah. Uh, the, the proof that you gave for the auction uh, would seem very intuitive in comparison to your, the proof for routing. Okay. So the auction proof, you're saying, well, this guy bids half his value, either the revenue is high or he wins bidding half his value, in which case his utility is half his value. And that statement is something that uh, is fairly intuitive. Yes. Versus if you remember the first slide of the algebra. Yes. I had almost no intuition for it. Yeah, so what's, what's the deal, basically? Like, why, why don't we have a simple proof for the first one as the second one? I'm saying, you know, somehow the smoothness bound that's on the, the right board yeah. has some intuition under it that uh, is more clear, transparent, than the smoothness bound on the left board. Right. So, because the right board is auctions, Jason. <laughs> no, let me. So, actually, I, I would actually argue, in addition to that, in addition to that, I, I would actually argue that the conditions on the board are, of, in my opinion, close to equal complexity. But here's what you pointed out, which is absolutely correct, which is that, which is sort of like, which is more the proof of how do you establish this with interesting parameters. And you're pointing out that in the auction world, we were able to argue bidder by bidder. We said for every bidder I, here's an interesting guarantee about I. And then, oh, we have many bidders, we'll just add them up. So in say routing games, it's not so simple. Okay, I don't really know an interesting way, I don't know an interesting player by player guarantee. Because, you know, it's this big network and you have different sources and destinations, you know, and you might be screwed just because you're in a bad place in the network and other people are playing weird strategies. So something that's fundamental, I think, about, about these routing games is and, and sort of magic that actually you can handle both these applications in the same way because it feels like something very different is going on. Really, this is saying in aggregate over the players. Some players are bad, but they can be, in effect, charged to, you know, the players that are doing well in some sense. Um, and so that's my interpretation of why this is more complicated. Do you have any insight on that, Elias? Or? Yeah. So, that's, so here you have to handle all the players in, in one shot. Auctions, you can do it player by player. I guess in some sense, over on the, on the right board, this one player thing does compare to this aggregate thing, which is revenue. In the one player statement versus. How about the proposal that because we have a composition theorem, so you can only argue about uh, auctions on a single item? If you could only argue congestion games on a single congestible element, that certainly would sound better. But I thought he did. He argued per edge. Yeah, that's, that's right. So you have an edge by edge. That's maybe the right way to think about it. So to follow up on what Ava's saying. It's sort of the right way to decompose the computation for auctions is player by player. The right way to decompose it for routing games is edge by edge. And maybe you could argue, and so the work that you do on an edge is basically these two lines. And like, okay, I mean, the other thing to realize is like if the optimal answers are five thirds and one third, it's probably gonna be at least a slightly non-trivial computation, right? I mean, so that's part of what's going on. But um, I would say, I mean, these are the two lines that are playing the role of the bidder by bidder analysis. But I, you know, I agree with you. I, I do think uh, this is a little more, you know, if you just wanted to look at it and be like, oh yeah, of course, I'm not so sure how you do that. Whereas the auctions, you can kind of talk through why every step is maybe something you would have expected in hindsight. I don't know how to do that here. All right, see you tomorrow.